Today is the final sermon in the sermon series, Revive Us Again, a return to Jesus' original program. Inspired by Father Gregory Boyle's book, Barking to the Choir, The Power of Radical Kinship, the series opened on September 11th. It was my hope and prayer that focusing on the vision and the power of radical kinship found in Jesus, we would all experience revival and renewal. Through faith, hope, and especially love, we've explored many understandings of Jesus' vision. These elements have been forgiveness and healing, humility, which I framed as smelling like the sheep, inclusion with Jesus as the number one includer, tenderness and love, being present as we look and live, as we live in the here and the now, living with endless gratitude and today compassion. Plus Reverend Samuelson added her beautiful sermon on transitions entitled On the Way. I hope this series has brought a revival to your spirit and that we have sought to return, as we've sought to return to the elements of Jesus' original program. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Luke's Gospel speaks of Zacchaeus as a small man. Besides being short, Zacchaeus was small in the way that his range of dealings with other human beings went. He had severely taken advantage of people around him, and I mean all around him. As a tax collector, he was exacting, he was unforgiving in collecting what was owed him, and then of course adding on top of that a gouging of others in unrelenting ways. He was a little man inside and out. Luke 19 tells us that he climbed the sycamore tree to see Jesus. Who knows, he might have been getting out of the way of the crowds who all knew who he was and who he had abused through his relentless tax collecting measures. But be that as it may, Jesus spotted him up in the tree. He called him out of the tree and ended up going to his house for a meal. As you can tell from the passage we just read, a very unpopular action by Jesus. As you all know, and as it has been said to you many times, Jesus loved to eat, right? He loved being with other people at the dinner table. And since he had no money, a free meal was a necessary part of his keeping alive and his going on. And think of it this way, on this particular day, with Zacchaeus up a tree, he was able to feed not only himself, but all of his disciples. So this was a good thing. And it must have been a great dinner party because at the end, Zacchaeus turned his entire life around, giving back half of all the possessions that he had taken, giving it back to the poor. And that means just about everybody in the region. It was not a wealthy region, the region of Galilee and then granting four times the amount to anyone who he had defrauded, which would be just about everyone in the region, right? He turned his life completely around by all measures. And on that day, this man measured up in new and rewarding ways. He was headed to heaven on a nonstop train out of hell. In his book, The Measure of a Man, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, the ultimate measure of a man, and I'm gonna read in person here, the ultimate measure of a person is where that person stands, not where that person stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where that person stands in times of challenge and controversy. The measure of a person is where that person stands in times of challenge and controversy. Wow, that's a powerful statement. Words that certainly would be able to be used as a measure for each and every one of us. They're also immeasurably true for Jesus and the little man of Galilee, Zacchaeus. In the measure of each of them as men, each ends up giving all they have, if you will, and turning things around. They stand face to face with the challenge and the controversy of their space and time, and give full measure of devotion and resources away to others. In Jesus' case, 
He's giving away his whole self as a healer and teacher. In Zacchaeus's case, he gives away all of the measures of his economic success through economic justice. They both are compassionate, each in their own way. The word compassion is a beautiful word. It comes from the Latin, pati, which means to suffer, together with the prefix com means to suffer with. To be compassionate means to suffer with somebody, to recognize the suffering of others, and then take action to help them. Compassion embodies a tangible expression of love for those who are suffering. And compassion is different from empathy. Empathy is the ability to relate to another person's pain as if it was your own. Empathy, like sympathy, is grounded in emotion and feeling. But empathy doesn't have the action component that compassion does. It is heart, but it's not always action. Compassion is action and heart always together. In his book, Father Gregory Boyle tells the story of one Sunday morning when his homeboys are leading worship. He, as, as he's reading the opening to the liturgy, one of them accidentally replaces the word exaltation with exhaustion. It sounds something like this. We give praise and worship to God, the God of exhaustion. There's so much truth in that, isn't there? Our exhausted God must look at us and wonder, why are they talking about exaltation? Can't they see I'm worn out? What's going on with my children? What? have I done? My beautiful children, they fight each other, they kill each other. That really exhausts me. There must be something about an exultant God which leaves us a little hollow inside, but we can really relate to an exhausted God, can't we? Our exhausted God is full of compassion and love. Our exhausted God is the one who stays up with us all night when we rock the babies. The exhausted God is the one who meets with us on the steps of the church with our unhoused neighbors. The exhausted God is the one who frets about the struggles of our children and grandchildren just like we do. The exhausted God is the one who feels our pain deep inside when we know others are hurting deep inside. Our exhausted God is full of compassion and is not really into being exalted as much as we like to exalt God. I think that's true for Jesus as well. He was much more interested in caring for the exhausted than getting the exaltation and helping those who are up a tree. On this Reformation Sunday, let's take a look at the compassionate words and efforts of those who set us on this path of faith, this Reformation path, remembering that compassion embodies action. I came across a fascinating article on Martin Luther, who cared for those in his community who had mental illness or had serious mental health concerns. While doctors wanted to put those who we would call schizophrenic away and wanted to label them as evil and send them out of the community, Luther would spend time with them, knowing their history, listening lovingly, and taking in their situations, taking their souls seriously. In one case, Luther met a man who was full of melancholy. He was refusing to eat or to drink. He hid in a cellar. He lived in the dark. He turned away from all charitable helpers saying, don't you see that I am a corpse and I have already died? Leave me alone. How can I eat? And Luther came to him. He had known him as his pastor through the years. He came to this man in the darkness of his cellar and brought light and care to him. He reintegrated him into society using his personal relationship with the man that really mattered. He had a name for this. Luther called it compassionate reintegration. So we always think of him as writing the great theologies or making the case for the Reformation. But here he was, caring for one man. Rather than stigmatizing, Martin Luther integrated. But God was a little less exhausted because one man cared for another. 
Now, John Calvin was another of the great reformers and is seen by most of us as stern and uncaring, a man who lived in his head to the detriment of his heart, right? But if you examine his letters, you will find that Calvin was deeply moved by human suffering, reflecting on the suffering of people in Geneva, the death of his wife, the needs of his children, and the need for generosity for refugees coming from the war in France over to Geneva. Calvin spoke from the heart time and time and time again. It was tenderness and compassion that permeated the whole of Calvin's soul. Perhaps it is time to remember that the greatest measure of compassion ever offered the world in both Jewish and Christian scriptures and found in every world religion everywhere is something we just simply call the golden rule. The golden rule is the critical centerpiece for faith in action as Christians and Jews. Moreover, the golden rule is a guide that should direct every human being in relationship to every other human being. The golden rule calls us to treat other people the way we want to be treated ourselves. In Matthew 7, 12, Jesus says it this way. So in everything, very important phrase that he uses to open the passage, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up all of the law and all of the prophets. The Gospel of Luke breaks it down more simply. He just says to do, do to others as you would have them do to you which is the way we usually speak of the golden rule. But in each of the passages we come to know, and also in Leviticus, the law of Moses reads, do not seek revenge or bear grudges against any other person among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. And I love this at the end of Leviticus, it says, do this because I am the Lord. There's a certain clarity in the Hebrew scriptures, when God ends a thing by saying, do this because I'm telling you to do it, I am your God. Something powerful about that. Somewhere in the politics of fear and disdain, which we see and hear all around us today, the golden rule has been lost and forgotten. It is time to resurrect the golden rule for each of our lives. It is certainly time to bring back the golden rule right now as we face the 2022 elections. There's not enough mute buttons in this world to turn off the commercials we're seeing. Not to mention our need to call to compassionate daily living and action each and every one of us. Pope Francis reminded us during his historic address to Congress in September 2015 that the golden rule has political implications and always requires action. He said, the rule points us in a clear direction. Let us treat others with the same passion and compassion which we want to be treated with. Let us seek for others the same possibilities which we seek for ourselves. Let us help others to grow as we would like to help ourselves to grow. In a word, if we want security, let us give security. If we want life, let us give life. If we want opportunities, let us provide opportunities. Near the end of his book, Father Boyle tells the story of a lifer at Lancaster Prison in California, someone he visited often inside the prison. But this man tells that he had finally discovered in the suffering he experienced behind bars that compassion always breeds hope. He told this to Father Boyle, and Father Boyle looked at him inside the cell and said he'd come to understand what compassion really meant, that compassion breeds hope. Each of us is being called every day by our exhausted God to create an environment where optimal healing can take place, an environment where a person can truly be helped to thrive in this world, or in Father Boyle's words, a community so loving that everyone feels like they're wearing a parachute. When we seek first the kinship of God, we will come to know the fullness of God's love. As the Apostle John wrote, if we walk in the light, we will have fellowship with one another. So let us suffer with each other. Let all who inhabit this fragile planet of ours suffer with each other. Let us learn to live the golden rule in our daily dealings. And on this eve 
of All Hallows Eve, let's remember, there is nothing spooky about this. Compassion breeds hope. So let's walk in the light of our exhausted God and be in fellowship together. Amen.